I think we're going to have a real battle for the soul of the Republican Party over the next couple of years. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jackie Alamany, anchor of Power Up, the Washington Post early morning newsletter. Welcome to the Washington Post Live today. I'm thrilled to introduce to you our guest, Governor Larry Hogan, for our program on leadership during crisis. Uh, Hogan is a very popular Republican in a Democratic state. We're going to be talking about the pandemic, the Biden relief plan, vaccine distribution, reopening schools, as well as the future of the Republican Party. I apologize. That's my dog squeaking on her. <laughs> little fake avocado. Um, Governor Hogan, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, yeah, thank you, Jackie. Thanks for having me. And uh, I kind of like the dog. I've got two dogs at home that like to squeak like that, too. I caved on the <laughs> pandemic puppy. Well, so it's a great time to begin. spend with puppies. <laughs> let's begin right off with Biden's uh, $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan. Congress is set to vote on it this week. Are states like yours getting what they need from this package? Well, look, I uh, was uh, lucky enough to uh, be invited by uh, to be in the Oval Office last week with President Biden and Vice President Harris. And, you know, I made the point very clearly that uh, states do need some assistance to state and local governments. We do need to get some relief out to people that really need it. But that I thought they were they were trying to load far too much onto this package that was making it unpalatable. Uh, to a lot of uh, the people in Congress, and that I thought it was important for him uh, to try to at least work toward some kind of a bipartisan compromise uh, to get a relief bill passed. But then I said it would be better if he could get some buy-in from uh, from Republicans who have some concerns about the big price tag. I I'm wondering, though, Americans overwhelmingly feel positively and approve of this package. Why haven't Republicans bought in when the majority of their constituencies want this funding and, and desperately want this package to be passed? Well, I was leading the fight for the last stimulus package for eight and a half months as, uh, as the chairman of the National Governors Association, where we had nearly unanimous agreement among all 50 governors, but we had uh, both the Democrats in the House and Republicans in the Senate miles apart. And, uh, you know, I'm involved. I'm the chairman of a group called No Labels that has the Problem Solvers Caucus that actually br drug both parties to the middle to reach a compromise on the last stimulus package. And it was not enough. It didn't cover all the problems, but at least something got done. I think most Americans don't know what's in this package. And they, you know, there's some very desperately needed relief. And I'm all for getting one uh, a bill passed as soon as we can. Uh, but I think we need to try to take out some of these things that don't have anything to do with the virus. Look, here in my state, right after I left the White House, I came back to Annapolis where we passed a $1.2 billion tax relief and stimulus package nearly unanimously through my legislature, which is 70 percent Democrat in both houses. And we got nearly every Republican and Democrat to agree. We got the, uh, the relief uh, money out to the people of Maryland within a few days. And so I, I think it can be done. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, cooler heads will prevail and we can come together on a compromise. So when you mentioned provisions that you don't think are, are pertinent to the crisis at hand, uh, I'm wondering if you're referring to minimum wage. Well, it's one of the things that I brought up in the uh, in the Oval Office. I mean, we could we can debate the merits of uh, of whether or not we should have a minimum wage increase or not, but it's not really part of the immediate emergency relief bill that we so desperately need and that we have to find consensus on. So, you know, pull that out. And there, uh, there are a number of things like that that we can we can have debates on. Democrats may still be able to pass. Uh, but let, let's get the relief that we do agree on and get that done. And so I'm wondering the, what your current stance is on minimum wage. The minimum wage in Maryland is $10 an hour. You've previously vetoed raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We're going to be hearing from the Senate parliamentarian this week at some point about whether or not there can be a federal wage hike through the process of budget reconciliation. If that gets pushed through, where do you stand on the issue? You know, I know you've said that you well, believe that well, raising my state it will does be have a job. Yeah, my, my, my state does have a, uh, a glad path to get to the $15 minimum wage. It already, it already passed. It overrode my veto. I, I didn't want to move too quickly and hurt small businesses, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. 
uh, where we've had the worst unemployment, in, you know, in my lifetime. Uh, to, to try to have more people lose their jobs. But, um, you know, we, we work together with the, the uh, de Republicans and Democrats here. We are going to increase the minimum wage. But again, I don't think that should be something right now that we're fighting about in Congress when we desperately need the relief package to pass. And I think it could have the opposite effect of making people lose their jobs. Uh, and you had mentioned this, that you had signed a bipartisan package um, for a $1.1 billion state COVID relief bill. Um, are there any lessons that you think Congress can take from uh, working across the aisle to, to get that through from that bipartisan effort? Well, you know, I introduced this legislation at the beginning of our legislative session, which just started last month. Uh, and I said to my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle that this was critically important and we had to come together. We had discussions back and forth. There were some amendments to the bill that we negotiated and worked together on. And I, I think a big part of that was just agreeing that uh, we were going to come together to help the people of our state that we all represent. Um, and there were Republicans and Democrats, believe it or not, sitting down at the table together. Uh, I was talking with the Speaker and the Senate President on an ongoing basis. And again, we had one Republican in the House vote against it. Every single Republican and Democrat in both chambers other than that voted for this package. And, and we started sending checks out within three days. And you have continuously called on the federal government to provide more vaccines to Maryland, which has struggled with getting vaccinations distributed at, at a rate um, on par, on pace with other states around the country. Has the government responded to you on that? What have those conversations looked like? Well, we just I just hung up a, a phone call with the uh, White House Coronavirus uh, Task Force headed by Jeff Zients with the rest of the nation's most of the uh, other governors from across the country. And, uh, you know, the, the, they are communicating with all of us on a weekly basis. We have some very productive discussions. They are doing everything that they, they, they can, and they're promising to increase production. Uh, but with respect to, uh, you know, there's different stats that can show different things. Every state is completely different in the, the number of healthcare workers, the people of certain ages and different uh, diversity, uh, you know, breakdowns according to states. But we have now put 99.7% of all of our vaccines into someone's arms. Uh, the first doses and that we've scheduled all the rest of them. We can't do much better than that. No, no one can, but we just need the same problem we have that every state in America, every county, every city uh, has, and that is that we just need more vaccines. It's something that we're all working on together. It, it's an all hands on deck uh, effort from the federal, state, local governments, along with the private sector. And when was that phone call with Zeins? Did, did he reveal anything new uh, during the weekly call this week? It was just uh, an hour ago, and uh, we, just before I joined you, really, um, and uh, uh, we had, I think, most of the governors on the call. We had the head of the CDC. We had General Perna, who's responsible for distribution. We talked through some issues like, you know, they've done a great job of catching up from those weather delays. There were about 7 million vaccines that were delayed all across the country because the hubs were frozen over. Uh, the factory workers that were loading them up and getting them out the door couldn't get to work. Uh, planes couldn't fly out of their distribution center. So, but they're catching up and promised that uh, by tomorrow, I think they're going to catch up on all 7 million of those doses that they're behind on. And they uh, committed to increasing, uh, gradually increasing production. It's not uh, enough to make anyone happy, including them, uh, but they are making some slow progress towards that. The other good news was, uh, you know, we discussed the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is just about ready to receive, hopefully, FDA approval, uh, and that uh, they'll be able to uh, send out to us uh, 20 million of those doses by the end of March, which is uh, it's going to be a tremendous, uh, no pun intending, uh, a shot in the arm. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be great if we can get 20 million more vaccines by the end of March. And and they expect us to continue to ramp up through the end of June when we're expected, expected to have a couple of million vaccines. In, in the meantime, it's a very frustrating process for everyone involved because the demand far exceeds the supply that's available anywhere in the country. I'm wondering if Texas Governor Greg Abbott was on the call and if he raised any issues specific to Texas and the crisis that they're going through right now and how that's sort of put, uh, thrown a wrench into vaccine distribution in a state that's, you know, that lost power for a week and now it doesn't have, uh, you know, clean water for millions of uh, Texas residents. Well, it's a terrible uh, tragedy what's going on in Texas. I don't believe that Governor Abbott was on a call. He could, he could have been on an audio call. I just didn't happen. He didn't uh, speak up. I didn't. Did, he's probably focused on the crisis in Texas. Uh, but uh, there's no question that, that they've got their hands full down there. And 
um, in addition to the vaccine rollout, uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the weather-related crisis and the power outages. And I want to get to an audience question because I think it touches on a topic that we have seen um, a, a, a handful of subscribers and respondents to this event um, lodge some um, gripes about, that there have been problems with people of color getting vaccinated at a rate on par with um, white Marylanders. Uh, so this question is from Nadine Taylor from Maryland, and she's wondering why it's so difficult for people of color who want to get a vaccine to get an appointment in the state. Well, it's very difficult for anyone in the state to get a vaccine, as I pointed out, because, uh, you know, we, we, we have 2.1 million people that are currently eligible to receive the vaccine. We've done, uh, as of today, 1.1 million uh, uh, injections into arms. So there are at least a million people who want one and can't get one. Um, but it's, you know, there is a different uptake in uh, vaccines in various communities, which is why we appointed a, 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 a general from the National Guard, African-American woman who's in charge of our, our equity task force. We've called on each of the local governments to, uh, to, to appoint uh, someone in charge of that for their local jurisdictions. We've, our first two mass vaccination sites were set up in Prince George's County and Baltimore City. We're opening up a third Baltimore City one at M&T Stadium on Thursday. We've put more vaccines into those jurisdictions, but there's no question there's been uh, an issue with getting them into arms. I was with uh, Angela also Brooks in Prince George's County, a, a majority a minority county that uh, they're working hard and we've got multiple mass vac sites. We did partnerships with Giant and Safeway and CVS. We're going into the community with mobile uh, units. And yet um, and, and the county executive was very frank with us about the frustrations of, uh, of people not wanting the vaccine. I, I was at a giant food inside the Beltway in District Heights, uh, majority black community where people were flat out saying in the giant and in the parking lot, we don't want the vaccine. And so we launched a major um, um, marketing effort with a public information, uh, um, public information campaign, recruiting leaders in the communities. We're, we're setting up uh, mobile vac sites at churches and community centers, and uh, we're working together to try to correct this problem. We're, we, we're, more, we're more transparent on, on race than any other state. We're the first ones to start tracking that back in testing. We're doing the same thing on uh, with respect to vaccines, but it's continually uh, becoming a problem uh, across the country that we're not getting as many into the arms of, of people in the black and brown communities. Yeah, and I, I just want to note the statistics here, which is that 63% of um, residents of your state who have received the vaccine are white, only 14% black, 9% other others. Uh, you know, members of Congress did recently send you a letter requesting more transparency when it comes to measures being taken to increase equity. Um, you, you have just obviously said that you believe that the state is the most transparent on the issue, but is there anything that you're doing in response to that, uh, ways that you could potentially increase transparency here? Uh, yeah, I think we're as transparent as we possibly can. I think we're the most uh, transparent in America, but we're continuing to meet with our our, uh, not only the, the, our members of Congress, but our local leaders and our uh, legislative leaders uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, again, we have uh, made more of an effort in the minority communities than anywhere else. About 30% of our vaccines have gone into minority arms, but not enough into uh, the, the real uh, shortfall is in the black community and in the Hispanic community, which um, uh, most of our effort is now focused on and has been from the beginning. And I want to pivot to a completely different topic. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to be appearing before the Senate um, on environmental and public works, along with Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, to, to discuss how transportation projects could be used to assist the economic recovery. Uh, I know it was a long-running joke that um, the Trump administration would finally get infrastructure done. We had you know, hundreds of infrastructure weeks. Do you think this is actually going to get done under Biden? Um, and obviously, when you were uh, head of the Governors Association, it's worth noting that your signature work was on infrastructure. What are you going to recommend tomorrow? Well, I, I sure hope we can make progress on infrastructure. It's critically important, especially as we try to come out of this pandemic and we work on economic recovery and job creation. I think uh, it, it can really dovetail with infrastructure investment uh, to try to make progress. When, when I became uh, chairman of the NGA, I, I got to select this, an initiative to focus on. Mine was on rebuilding America's infrastructure. We, we put together uh, 10 different summits around the country and around the world to talk, brought in the leaders of Congress, 
governors on both sides of the aisle, uh, people from academia, from, from uh, the private sector, from labor unions, uh, to try to get all the best ideas on how we could come up with some solutions. I brought this up uh, in the Oval Office to the president, who also says he's very focused on infrastructure. Uh, I mean, you're right. Uh, you know, th this is what the Trump administration said when they first came in. Uh, they said it was going to be their number one priority and nothing got done. Republicans and Democrats in Congress for more than a decade have said that they're going to work together on doing something about rebuilding America's crumbling infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I think it's critically important. Um, I, I, the, the president said he is very interested, it wants to work with us. Uh, I agreed to go testify at the Senate and provide, you know, some of my uh, input on the, the year-long infrastructure uh, summits that we did around the country and the report that we put together. It is going to take Republicans and Democrats coming together to fix this problem. There are we don't agree on all the issues of how to solve it, but there's some real creativity out there. And you know we've done that here in Maryland, where we've we've got a very balanced uh, you know uh, transportation uh, infrastructure uh, for the past six years. We've put 14 billion dollars into transit. We're building the largest public-private uh, uh, transit system in North America with the Purple Line. Uh, we just uh, last week approved the largest uh, P3 traffic relief project in, in the entire world uh, with rebuilding the American Legion Bridge, a beltway accord with the governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, uh, fixing the Capitol Beltway and I-270, which is the worst traffic congestion in America. I want to dig a little deeper into your conversation with President Biden in the Oval Office. Your relationship with President Trump was uh, notoriously contentious. You were one of the only Republicans who really consistently um, criticized the president over the past four years during the administration. What's it like working with a president and, and being on good terms uh, with one now? How how's that con contrasted to your relationship with President Trump? Well, I, I think I, you know, I, I'll agree that I, I wasn't ever afraid to stand up and disagree when I thought the president was making a mistake, or when, you know, I was I was leading all 50 governors throughout this pandemic crisis, and when they were failing on things like testing, and at the beginning of the crisis, uh, you know, I was uh, I was just uh, very open and honest about uh, where we were fighting on behalf of all the states, but I wasn't uh, just you know crit critical for no reason or attacking the president every day. Most of my focus was on bringing together all 50 governors and to raising those issues with the president. But I did lead 54 calls with all the nation's governors, most of with most, most of them with the president and or vice president and the entire team. So we had an ongoing relationship uh, with a lot of the members of the administration. I had a great relationship with Vice President Pence. Uh, but yet you're right that President Trump bristled uh, a little bit when I when I didn't always agree. Uh, and and I, I've known Joe Biden for, for a long time. I mean, he, he did invite uh, myself and another Republican governor, two Democratic governors, to spend an hour and a half in the, in the Oval Office just a week or so ago. And, and so, you know, I, I, he, was he seemed to be listening. He seemed to agree with the message of trying to work together with Republicans. And I, you know, I, I applaud them for uh, continuing those weekly calls with the governors uh, and, and, and have done a good job of reaching out. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll we'll continue to have a good relationship and find some things that we can work together on, like like infrastructure and like uh, coming together to get through this pandemic and get these vaccines administered. Yeah, I was just going to ask, other than infrastructure and COVID uh, relief, which are obviously two huge tasks at hand, is there anything else that you want to work with President Biden on? Well, the, the, you know, the thing that we're, I think the Biden administration and every governor in America is focused on the immediate crisis. You know, we're still in a state of emergency. We just hit 500,000 deaths. You know, we've lost 7,800 uh, Marylanders to this terrible pandemic. So we're focused on the vaccines. That's something we, we have to work together on. The economic recovery as a result of this global pandemic is something that we really need to work together on. And then after that, I think uh, the, the, the president has said that his, uh, his next priority is on infrastructure. And that's something that I, obviously was a top priority of mine, and which is why I focused on it for my year long effort uh, leading the governor. So I think that's a good start. Uh, if, if we can get some progress on those three things and we can uh, surely set a good tone for the next four years of getting things done. And I, 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 I pled with the, the, uh, the, the president about that. I said, look, if you get off on the wrong foot here, it doesn't, you know, it's going to be harder to find bipartisan uh, common ground on other issues. And so that's why I think it's, it's hopeful uh, that, you know, if we can get something done on these issues, then maybe we can move on and fix some of the real serious problems that are facing the country because we have to. I mean, it's what America's 
America really wants uh, us to, you know, work on the on the problems and come up with solutions together. And I want to get back to some of the issues currently facing the Republican Party. Um, you've said that the final chapter of Donald Trump and the party still hasn't been written. How are you going to change the future trajectory of the party that seems like it's still being run by Trump, who is the most popular Republican in the country? Well, I'm not sure, uh, you know, single-handedly I'll be able to change that trajectory. Uh, but I, I, I have said that I'm I'm going to continue to to speak out and stand up. You know, I'm a lifelong uh, Republican uh, who've been around a long time. I got involved in uh, in Ronald Reagan's campaign. Was a, a foot soldier in the Reagan Revolution. I guess been involved in most campaigns since then. And I I really think it's uh, critically important for the Republicans to focus on you know, trying to come up with, uh, with, with a message that appeals to a wider group of people. Uh, I think that uh, if we continue down this road, we're going to continue to lose elections. In, in a four-year period, we lost uh, the, the White House, the House of Representatives, the Senate. We lost governors and we lost legislative bodies. So it's, it's not a winning message to continue to uh, do the exact same thing and expect different results. Uh, but, I, you know, I would argue that here in the, one of the bluest states in America, uh, where I ran about 45 points ahead of uh, President Trump, that, that that there we can show that you know that there are Democrats and independents who will cross over and listen to a Republican leader or the Republican candidates. Um, we did win um, a lot of uh, purple states. You know, Susan Collins uh, was was reelected. We we uh, Phil Scott was reelected in Vermont as governor. We we won almost all of the uh, competitive House seats in in purple districts, competitive seats in suburban areas. So. You know, it's all is not, uh, you know, it's not like the party's completely lost. And and I'm old enough to remember from back when I was in high school, my dad was on the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment of Nixon. Everybody said that was the death of the Republican Party in, in 1974. And, uh, and in 1980, Ronald Reagan came in with the biggest landslide in history and rebuilt the party and, and uh, won 49 states and, uh, and, and stayed in there for two terms. And you might not be able to single-handedly you know, change the future of the party. Uh, but in a potential 2024 Republican presidential primary, if President Trump decides to run, would you run against him, hop in the race? Well, I, you know, I, right now, as I've said, I've got two more years in this very important day job of uh, as being governor of Maryland. We're in the middle of a state of emergency. I think the last thing we should be talking about today is uh, what's going to happen four years from now. But uh, I think we're, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next two years and the midterm elections and, and how well we perform. I'm very concerned about uh, electing candidates in a primary that can't win a general in November and, uh, and, and having a message that's about uh, building the tent rather than shrinking the tent. So it, it's far too early, but uh, I don't think the president will be running in, in four years, but time will tell. And I think there are a lot of leaders out there that hopefully are going to step up. I don't think I'll be the only one. So that doesn't sound like a no. Well, I've said I wouldn't uh, rule it out. I just think it's far too early to be talking about that when we've got, you know, frankly, more important things to do. Yeah. And, and you know, President Trump next week, it's, it's worth noting, um, is going to appear at CPAC to and potentially tease the fact that he's going to be running again in 2024. Were you invited to speak at CPAC? Uh, no, but again, I'm in, I wouldn't have attended because I'm in the middle of a, trying to deal with the, these twin crises of the pandemic and uh, and uh, this economic uh, crisis that we're in. So uh, no, no time for politics right now. Again, I think uh, what people are saying they're doing now is going to be a whole lot different. And we're going to see what develops over the next couple of years. Like like I said, the final chapter hasn't been written. I, for one, am, am going to continue to fight uh, to return uh, my party, the party that I've been involved in my whole life. Uh, to a more traditional Republican Party. And I want to get to the events of January 6th, the insurrection and the security breach that we saw on Capitol Hill. You've spoken very publicly about this, um, about how you tried to get the Maryland National Guard to the Capitol to help during the insurrection as quickly as possible, but faced some issues. Um, you had said that you were getting calls from leaders in Congress to get Maryland Guard into the city ASAP, but you weren't able to do so until hours later. Have you, um, in, in the weeks, months since that happened, happened, been able to get any clarity on uh, the holdup there? 
Not really. Um, I think uh, eventually we will get to the bottom of that. I mean, I know what was going on on our end of the phone call and what was happening with our decision making, but I don't know how the decisions were being made at the Pentagon or or the White House or or whoever was making those decisions. But yeah, I, I was um, uh, the, the, our guard was the first ones called up uh, outside of the district. We we got a call from the mayor of D.C. requesting our assistance. Uh, she did not have the authority to uh, to make that request. We were more than happy to try to help. We had to get the approval of the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, and it, it took us a couple of hours before we could obtain that. But in the meantime, we activate our guard. We called them up. We had them uh, assembling and prepared and ready. In the meantime, we sent several hundred uh, riot uh, trained uh, Maryland State Police officers immediately to the Capitol. They arrived along with the Metropolitan Police Force and. Um, and then our guard was the first one to uh, arrive uh, from outside of the city, but it was it was certainly delayed. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of speculation as to how and why. But I, I eventually, uh, after a long time of pleading and talking back and forth with the leaders of Congress who were who were uh, desperately crying out for help, uh, we finally got uh, a call from the uh, uh, secretary of the Army who uh, who asked us to come in. But we, we were taking every action we could to uh, get there as quickly as possible. And in a, state, a situation like that, with D.C. obviously being a neighboring um, state t- jurisdiction to Maryland, uh, you know, would you normally expect to get a call from the president during that moment of crisis for him directly asking you to send the guard? Is that something that you would have expected? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, um, you know, I've been governor for six years. Very rarely do you get a call from the president asking you to do something like that. I mean, during the riots of 2015, I, I got a call from uh, President Obama after I had sent the guard into Baltimore City. Uh, but uh, we ne- never had a president ask me. We do have neighboring governors occasionally in a in a in a state of emergency if there's a. Uh, a, a winter storm or flooding or whatever, we reach out to, uh, you know, adjacent to governors and request assistance or provide assistance. And we've done that a number of times with a number of different states and people have come to our aid. Uh, DC is a little bit of a different situation because they're not a state and they don't have a governor. Uh, and that's the only one, uh, that's the only place where uh, they, the guard actually falls under the command of the, uh, uh, of the Defense Department. And you mentioned that you're close with and have a positive relationship with Vice President Mike Pence. Did you speak with him on the the uh, on January 6 while he was trapped in the Capitol at all, or shortly thereafter? I, I did not. We, so we were trying to. Uh, we were. We got the call from Steny Hoyer, who was uh, whisked away. Uh, Vice President, I did, you know, knew uh, we couldn't uh, probably reach him or or try to bother him, but I knew that he had been. Uh, taken to a safe uh, location as well. I was hearing that from the congressional leaders. Um, We were taking all the actions here on the ground. I reached out to uh, Vice President um, numerous times after that, and I I still have not had a chance to connect with him. And I think that's that's been true of a number of people. I think he's, uh, uh, you know, I'm anxious to talk to him just to uh, let him know I'm concerned about him. And I was proud of of him for standing up and uh, doing the right thing. And has any law enforcement called you or contacted you to ask for your testimony or to provide any account to the series of events and and the crisis on January 6th? For example, we just found out um, that uh, Pentagon officials will be testifying next week on Capitol Hill about their response to the Capitol breach. Has any law enforcement agency called you to provide an account? Not yet, um, but you know we'd be happy to provide whatever uh, facts that we can provide, and uh, be happy to uh, cooperate with whoever uh, is looking for that information. But we haven't as yet. I did get a call, uh, you know, uh, a couple of days after the events of January sixth, from the Secretary of Defense, who, who, uh, you know, just called to thank us for responding so quickly and for sending in the guard. But I, I still haven't uh, haven't been asked to, to provide any testimony to anyone. And sorry, there's just so much to get to, and we have limited time left. Um, but do you think Democratic House impeachment managers made a mistake in not calling witnesses um, during the trial? You know, I'm not an expert on uh, on uh, congressional you know procedures, and I, I don't want to second guess who did what. Uh, you know, I, I just. Uh, I, obviously, it didn't have the uh, the result that they uh, that they were hoping that it would. Uh, it, it took a lot of courage for uh, at least uh, some Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, to stand up and 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 vote to impeach. But uh, I, as far as procedural, you know, decision making, 
uh, wh whether Jamie Raskin or his team uh, did the right thing, it's, it's really out of my uh, jurisdiction since I've never served in Congress. Uh, and I have two more quick questions, Governor, uh, for your fellow Republicans who have continued to repeat the big lie um, that really caused the events of January 6th, the baseless assertion that President Trump won the election. I'm wondering if you can help them set the facts straight here and guide them in the right direction. Well, I've certainly tried to since the since the night of the election. I think I was the first Republican to congratulate uh, President-elect Biden. We had conversations shortly thereafter. Uh, I've spoken up, you know, every day since November, just about when any, anyone asked me. There's no question that these uh, assertions about uh, the election being stolen are false. It, it led to, uh, you know, the, the constant uh, spreading of these of this misinformation uh, did lead to this insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that we're going to have to get a handle on is, uh, you know, people are going to have to stand up and admit that, that, that the facts are facts that the truth is the truth and that we can't continue to uh, go down the path of uh, chasing uh, conspiracy theories into rabbit holes uh, that that's not good for our party and it's not good for the country. And lastly, I just want to note that you are a cancer survivor. I'm sure this past year outside of a professional capacity has been challenging. How have you stayed um, healthy during this time? Well, I, you know, thank you for mentioning that. Look, I'm 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 way beyond my cancer uh, battle, and I'm uh, perfectly healthy and completely cancer-free. But there's no question, all the governors on the front lines, we were in a stressful situation along with everybody else in America dealing with this COVID crisis. I've been following my own uh, public health advice and the advice of all the, uh, the the experts, the epidemiologists, and public health officials by just trying to avoid crowds. Uh, we have the highest mask compliance of any state in America. Um, you know, we've been avoiding crowds and uh, I, I've been focused on my day job as governor every day and every night, but haven't been attending too many uh, events anywhere else or, or trying to, you know, follow the right advice and stay healthy like we're asking all the rest of the people in our state to do. Anything else you've been doing to try to stay sane um, while, while cooped up during this, this crisis? Well, it you know, you, we started out with uh, your dog uh, chewing on the squeaky toy, and I've got two uh, two little puppies myself that we adopted. And, uh, you know, when you can't hug people and you can't go out in crowds, the, the puppy love has been a great, uh, you know, kind of a mental health uh, stress reliever for me. I, I can hug the puppies as much as I want when I get home. Two puppies is a lot to take on. <laughs> what kind of dogs? They're, uh, they're Shih Tzus that we got from a rescue in Baltimore. Very cute. Um, well, I wish we had more time, Governor. I so appreciate you taking the time out of your really busy day to speak with us. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Please stay tuned to The Washington Post Live because at 2.30 today, we're going to have San Francisco Mayor London Breed. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have vaccine maker Novavax's president, Dr. Gregory Glenn. For a list of all of our upcoming guests, please go to thewashingtonpostlive.com. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Jackie Alamany, and we hope to see you again soon.